Welcome back to our lecture series on nanostructure materials, science and technology. I am Professor Ashutosh Tiwari from the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at the University of Utah. In the previous lecture, we studied crystallography and diffraction, understanding how atomic planes and reciprocal lattices determine material properties. Today, we shift from analyzing nanostructures to creating them. This lecture introduces nanofabrication, focusing on approaches that deliberately shape matter at the nanometer scale. We will explore why nanofabrication is central to modern technology and examine several representative methods, mechanical, pattern-based and chemical, used to form nanoscale features. Nanofabrication bridges the gap between nanoscience and nanotechnology. It provides the means to turn theoretical ideas about atomic scale behavior into tangible structures such as transistors, sensors, catalysts, and nanomechanical systems. For any nanoscale device to function, its components must be fabricated with precise spatial control, often below 100 nanometers. Achieving this control requires specialized tools and strategies that can manipulate or shape materials with atomic level accuracy. In the next few slides, we will classify these methods and then explore in detail the top-down category of fabrication techniques. Nanofabrication methods fall broadly into two categories. In the top-down approach, we begin with bulk material and reduce it to the nanoscale by removal, patterning or shaping. Examples include ball milling, lithography and etching. In contrast, the bottom-up approach assembles atoms and molecules into larger structures through processes such as soil gel synthesis, chemical vapor deposition, electroplating and self-assembly. Both approaches complement each other. Top-down ensures precision and pattern fidelity, while bottom-up offers atomic control and scalability from the smallest building blocks. This lecture focuses on the top-down family. One of the earliest and most practical top-down nanofabrication methods is high-energy ball milling. The principle is straightforward. Powders and hardened balls are sealed into a rotating drum. As the drum turns, collisions between balls and powder particles generate intense impact and friction. These repeated collisions cause severe plastic deformation, progressively refining grain size into the nanometer range, typically 5 to 100 nanometer. Ball milling is versatile and cost effective. It can process metals such as aluminum and copper, alloys including steels and high entropy systems, ceramics like zirconia and even metal matrix composites. Because of its scalability and simplicity, it is used extensively in both laboratories and industrial production. The driving mechanism of ball milling is the alternating sequence of impact and friction. Each collision transmits kinetic energy to the powder trapped between the balls. During impact, particles fracture, producing smaller fragments. During relaxation, some cold wear also, forming new interfaces. This continuous cycle of fracture and welding refines the grains step by step. Dislocations and strain accumulate and eventually nanocrystalline structures with extremely high defect densities emerge, responsible for enhanced hardness, strength and reactivity. Different mill designs achieve similar goals through distinct motion paths. A planetary mill has jars rotating on their own axis while orbiting a central axis, producing very high energy and shear, ideal for small batches and alloying research. An attritor mill uses a stationary vertical tank with a rotating steerer shaft, enabling continuous operation and larger batch sizes, 
well suited to industrial nanocomposites. A shaker mill rapidly oscillates a while, giving moderate energy and small batch capacity, useful for quick laboratory tests or a mechanochemical reactions. Each configuration balances energy input, throughput and scalability depending on the intended application. Several parameters govern the efficiency of ball milling. Milling time, longer duration yield finer grains but risk contamination. Rotational speed or energy input, higher speeds increase collision frequency and energy transfer. Ball to powder ratio, a higher ratio accelerates refinement yet may promote agglomeration. Atmosphere, inert gases such as argon or nitrogen prevent oxidation while reactive gases can initiate compound formation. By tuning these variables, researchers can tailor microstructure, composition and phase evolution to achieve desired properties. At the atomic scale, ball milling induces severe plastic deformation. Dislocation multiplication subdivides grains into nano-sized domains while stored strain energy may stabilize metastable or amorphous phases. As a result, we can obtain nanocrystalline metals, alloys, ceramics and composite powders exhibiting enhanced mechanical strain, magnetic behavior or catalytic activity. Nevertheless, challenges remain. Contamination from the milling media, broad particle size distribution and difficulty in achieving large scale uniformity. Understanding these trade-offs helps select optimal milling conditions for each material system. So far, we have discussed a mechanical route for producing nano-sized powders. Let us now turn to pattern-based nanofabrication, where we create nanoscale features directly on solid surfaces. Unlike ball milling, which refines particles in bulk, these methods produce precise, repeatable patterns used in integrated circuits, sensors, and photonic devices. The most prominent patterning technique is lithography followed by etching, which transfers those patterns into functional material. Lithography aims to define nanoscale patterns with high spatial precision. A typical process cycle includes substrate preparation and resist coating. Exposure to a beam of light or any other radiation. Development to reveal the pattern regions. Etching to transfer the pattern into the substrate and resist removal for a clean surface. This coat, expose, develop, etch, clean sequence underpins nearly every semiconductor and MEMS fabrication workflow. Lithography thus translates digital design data into tangible nanostructures. Photolithography is the foundation of modern semiconductor manufacturing. A light source projects ultraviolet radiation through a pattern mask onto a photoregist coated wafer. The transparent and opaque regions of the mask determine which parts of the register are exposed. In positive registers, Exposed regions dissolve away. In negative registers, exposed regions cross link and remain. Resolution depends on the wavelength lambda and the numerical aperture of the optics, with an approximate limit of lambda by 2 times Na. To achieve a smaller feature, industry has evolved from near UV 365 nanometer to deep UV. 248 nanometer and 193 nanometer, immersion lithography, and currently extreme UV, 13.5 nanometer. Photolithography offers high throughput and wafer scale precision, but demands costly optics, masks, and alignment systems. Electron beam lithography eliminates masks altogether. A finally focused electron beam scans across an electron-sensitive register according to a computer-generated pattern. Because electron wavelengths at tens of kilo electron volts 
are extremely small, EPL achieves sub 10 nanometer resolution, making it invaluable for quantum devices, nanowires, and nanophotonic components. The flexibility of design allows any arbitrary geometry. However, EBL is slow and expensive since it writes point by point, limiting its use to research and low volume prototyping rather than mass production. Iron beam lithography operates on similar principles as EBL, but uses ions instead of electrons. Because ions are far heavier, their de Broglie wavelength is much shorter than that of electrons, which means in principle, they can be focused into finer spots, achieving even higher theoretical resolution, sometimes below 10 nanometers. However, in practice, both ion and electron beam lithography reach comparable sub 10 nanometer resolution. Since the limiting factors are resist chemistry, beam interactions, and system stability rather than a wavelength alone. The main distinction lies in the interaction with the substrate. Ions being massive deliver more momentum and energy which can cause implantation and surface damage. Thus, while ion beam lithography potentially offers higher precision, it trades off with slower speed and greater substrate impact making it primarily a research or a correction tool rather than a high throughput fabrication method. After pattern definition, etching transfers those patterns into the underlying material. Etching selectively removes exposed regions while protected areas remain intact. Two main categories exist, wet etching using liquid chemical solutions and dry etching using plasmas or energetic ions. The critical attributes are selectivity, preferentially removing one material over another, and directionality, controlling whether the process is isotropic or anisotropic. Wet etching is generally isotropic, while dry etching can achieve vertical, well-defined sidewalls essential for nanoscale electronics. In wet etching, the wafer is immersed in a liquid chemical etchant that reacts with the exposed material to dissolve it into solution. Because the reaction proceeds equally in all directions, the resulting profile is rounded and may undercut the resist. Wet etching is simple, inexpensive and offers high removal rates, useful for many macro or microscopic uh, steps. Common examples include hydrofluoric acid for SiO2, KOH or TMAH for silicon, and acid mixtures such as nitric acid or aquaresia for metals. Its limitations are poor directionality and limited control, making it unsuitable for features that require sharp vertical edges. Dry etching uses plasmas and ion bombardment to achieve anisotropic, controllable profiles. In plasma etching, reactive neutral species chemically attack the surface. In reactive ion etching, RIE, ions are accelerated toward the wafer by an electric field, physically sputtering atoms and assisting chemical reactions at the surface. Variants such as deep RIE, also known as Bosch process, create high aspect ratio trenches while inductively coupled plasma RIE allows higher plasma densities and precise depth control. Dry etching provides the resolution and verticality needed for integrated circuits, MEMS, and nanophotonic structures, through, though it involves high equipment cost and potential ion-induced damage. To highlight the comparison, wet etching is a chemical process that removes material isotropically, equally in all directions. It is simple, fast and inexpensive, making it ideal for large area processing where extreme precision is not essential. Dry etching, particularly reactive ion etching RIE, relies on energetic ions and reactive species 
to achieve anisotropic profiles with vertical side walls. This directional control allows for the definition of extremely fine patterns at the nanoscale. When combined with lithography, etching techniques enable the fabrication of MEMS and NEMS components, semiconductor transistors, metal interconnects, and nanostructured optical or catalytic surfaces. Together, these processes provide the precision required to sculpt materials at nanometer dimensions forming the complex architectures that underpin today's advanced technologies. In this lecture, we explored how top-down nanofabrication transforms bulk materials into nanoscale structures through removal and patterning. Ball milling provides a mechanical route to produce nanocrystalline powders. Lithography defines patterns with nanometer precision and etching transfers those patterns into functional materials. Each method serves the same overarching goal, precise control of matter at extremely small dimensions. In the next lecture, we will examine bottom-up nanofabrication where atoms and molecules assemble spontaneously into ordered nanostructures, completing our view of how nanoscale materials are both formed and controlled.